Dear students, we at Saundarya Pre-University College have made an effort to reach out to you during this lockdown period of COVID-19 pandemic. Let us all fight against this situation patiently being indoors. Stay home, stay safe. In this lecture, we shall see a brief recapitulation of what transistor is and how do they work and concepts of transistor biasing. This video is done as per the syllabus prescribed for the Karnataka State Second Year Pre-University pre course. Our brain contains around 100 billion cells called neurons, the tiny switches that let you think and remember things. Computers contains billions of miniature brain cells as well. They are called transistors and they are made from silicon, a chemical element commonly found in sand. The giant strides that we have made in the field of electronics is after the invention of transistors, since they were first invented over half a century ago by John Bardeen, William Shockley and Walter Breton. The tiny transistors has revolutionized the world and the inventors of the transistors, they got Nobel Prize in Physics. The transistor was invented in December 1947 at Bell Labs, America. The head of the team was William Shockley and uh, who later invented the junction version of the transistor in 1951. The invent of, inventors of transistor, they got the Nobel Prize in 1956 for the invention of transistor. John Bardeen is the only physicist who received the Nobel Prize two times in physics. The first one was in 1956 and the second was in 1972 for explaining the superconductivity. This is the image of the first point contact transistor. Transistors have replaced the bulky vacuum tubes. So this is the image of the vacuum tubes. Earlier we used to use vacuum tubes uh, for the propagation of signals and so on. So these vacuum tubes were replaced by modern day transistors. So these are the images of modern day transistors. You can see here few images which shows you low power transistor, medium power transistor as well as high power transistors. And we also have the image of surface mount transistor and this is the image of a tiny transistor which is also called as surface mount transistors. I therefore have some suggested reading for you all. In fact, these are the wonderful talks about the inventors of transistors and the links will be provided in the description below. You can just go on to, to this link and just have a curious reading. Now let us know what exactly a transistor is. A transistor is a semiconductor device uh, which is used for the purpose of amplification of a weak signal and also it is used for the switching operations. So this is used for both analog as well as digital electronics. So if they ask you, mention our brain contains around 100 billion cells called neurons, the tiny switches that let you think and remember things. Computers contain billions of miniature brain cells as well. They are called transistors and they are made from silicon, a chemical element commonly found in sand. In this lecture, we shall see what transistor is 
and how do they work, what is meant by DC biasing, DC load line and operating point as per the syllabus prescribed by Karnataka state for second year pre-university. Transistors have revolutionized electronics since they were first invented over half a century ago by John Bardin, Walter Bratton and William Shockley. This tiny transistor revolutionized the world and the inventors of transistors got Nobel Prize in Physics. The transistor was invented in December 1947 at Bell Laboratories, USA. The transistor was invented by the team of John Bardeen, Walter Bratton and William Shockley. They got Nobel Prize in 1956 for the invention of transistor. John Bardeen is the only physicist who received the Nobel Prize two times in physics, one in 1956 for his invention of transistor and another in 1972 for BCS theory that is for superconductivity. This is the image of first point contact transistor. Transistors have replaced the bulky vacuum tubes that we used to see in the earlier days as uh, it is mentioned in the image and it is replaced by modern day transistors. So these are the images of modern day transistors and you can see here we have low power transistors, medium power transistors as well as high power transistors and also the surface mount transistors. Here I have a link of uh, some of the interviews and documentaries of the transistor inventors as well as uh, the archives from American telephone and telephony uh, website and uh, kindly go through this. This will be provided under th in the link uh, below. Now let us see what is meant by a transistor. A transistor is a semiconductor device which is used for the purpose of amplification that is amplifying weak signals as well as it is also used for switching operations. So this is used both in digital electronics as well as analog electronics. So if you are asked what are the applications of transistors or mention the applications of transistors, you can say amplifier, a transistor is used for the purpose of amplification and transistor can also be used as switches. So it is composed of semiconductor material and it has three terminals for its external connection. Now let us see the physical structure of a bipolar junction transistor. There are two kinds of bipolar junction transistors. One is a NPN transistor and other one is a PNP transistor. So what do we mean by NPN transistor? NPN transistor is a transistor where a P type material is sandwiched between two N type material. So we have a P material in the middle layer and two N type material on the two extreme sides. So such form formation gives rise to a NPN transistor. Now what do you mean by PNP transistor? A PNP transistor is one where N type material is sandwiched between two P type material. So such a connection is known as a PNP transistor. Now there are three leads for connection. So the first layer or first region is called as emitter region. The middle region is called as the base and the third layer is called as the collector layer or collector uh, layer. Now there are terminals are connected to this three layers and this goes for the external connection. So you can have a PNP transistor and NPN transistor. When you look at the image here between P and N in this PNP or N and P in the NPN transistor there is a junction. We have studied this in a semiconductor diode. Now you can see here
this is a p type region this is a n type region right so between p and n there is a junction there is a demarcation now when there is a junction between p and n so you can say this junction as junction between p and n the first junction between emitter and collector as emitter junction and the junction between base and collector as collector junction so there are two junctions here and this p n junction can be visualized as a p n semiconductor diode p n junction diode so you have anode this is the positive terminal and this is the negative terminal positive terminal is called as anode and negative terminal is cathode so this is positive negative so the diode is in this direction so this is anode and cathode and this is n and p again this is negative so we have a cathode here and anode here so a transistor can be visualized as two diodes connected back to back so this is the two diode analogy of a p and p transistor this is a two diode analogy of a n p n transistor so you have negative terminal positive terminal so positive terminal serves for both this junction as well as this junction now when you look into the circuit symbol the pnp transistor is indicated by this symbol so a transistor is indicated so we just write a circle we write three terminals three leads here so one is the base the middle layer is called as the base terminal so we call it as base the other two layers or other two layers are connected to the external circuit so one is called as collector other one is called as an emitter so how do we identify which is collector and which is emitter because when we say a transistor it has same 2p type material or it can be n type material also n p and n so there are two regions of the same kind either it can be 2 p's or 2 n so in between you have 1 p or 1 n so emitter and collector if i say this is the emitter terminal this is the collector terminal collector is indicated by c and the middle region as base as base now how to identify so we are going to mark a arrow symbol into the terminals so if i mark the arrow going out if the arrow is pointing outside and this is called as n p n transistor n p n transistor similarly for p n p transistor we'll show the indication here one for base one for emitter and one for collector so let me call this as base this as emitter terminal this as collector terminal now the arrow mark will be pointing inwards so this is a p n p transistor this is an n p n so you have to remember the arrow mark will be always pointing from p region to n region so this is the circuit symbol for a transistor this is a n p n transistor and this is for p n p transistor now as i told you this is n p n transistor between n and p we have a depletion region because of diffusion taking place and between p and n again we have a depletion region so now the transistor has two junctions here one is between n and p and another one is between p and n so junction between n and p you call this as junction 1 or we call it as emitter junction and the junction between the base and collector we call it as the collector junction or the junction between collector and base when you look into the structure of the transistor how the transistor is constructed so we can see here we have three layers three different layers of transistor n p and n to look at this let us uh, draw the structure once here see this is a pure semiconductor let us assume pure semiconductor now we will dope this pure semiconductor by n type 
impurity, pentavalent impurity. Now this becomes a n-type semiconductor. Now for this again we will dope with p-type, we will dope with p-type impurity. So now this becomes p-type, I am doping with a trivalent impurity now. So we have a p-type material into the same n-type material, it has been diffused here. Again we dope with one more n-type impurity once again, n-type impurity, so this is n-type. Now this becomes my emitter, this is the p region in between and this is the n region. So this we call this as emitter, when we go for the external connection, this is emitter terminal, this is base terminal, base and this is again collector terminal. So when we take the cross section of the transistor, I will just take this cross section here, we will just take the strip of this uh, transistor. So I will write once again, this is N, the first one, again I have P, this is P region and we have N region. So N region, you can see the size, physical size, this is emitter region, it is heavily doped and this is P region in between the emitter and the collector, it lies in between, the physical size of the P region is very very less and this is the collector which has larger area. So the NPN transistor, when I have taken the cross section here, I have N region and P region and N region, P region is sandwiched between two N type layers. So this gives us a structure of the transistor. So this is emitter heavily doped, collector is moderately doped and base is lightly doped. So the junction between emitter and base you call this as emitter junction. This is the junction between P and N, we have seen this in the semiconductor diode, N and P and the junction between this and this N and P, we call it as this is emitter, if I say this as emitter, base and collector, the junction between emitter and base, we call it as emitter junction emitter junction. We have another junction, second junction here, this is the junction between collector and base, we can call this as collector to base junction or just collector junction, collector junction. So there are two junctions, right, therefore it is called as junction transistor, there are junctions here between N and P and P and N, therefore when I say bipolar junction transistor, this junction refers to the junctions present in the, between the P and N type. So this is about the construction of transistor. Now we will see, this transistor, it is a three terminal device as we, uh, we take the transistor and connect it in different modes, we make it in common uh, base mode, we connect it in common emitter mode, we connect it in common collector mode, three different modes and how do we get this? So we can achieve this by making any one terminal common to both input and as well as output section. Why should we do this? So see here, so we will just take this as a block diagram, uh, two port network, it can be any network here. So this is the region or area where I am going to apply the input signal or input or whatever voltage. So I am going to apply the input between the terminal these two, this is called as input section. We are going to take out the energy, draw the energy between the terminals at this side. So we call this as output port. So this system is called as a two port network or you can also say four port device. So input is applied between this and this, output is drawn between this and this. So for a two port network, we should have four terminals, two at the input, two at the output. But a transistor has only three terminals, therefore we need to make any one terminal common to both input section as well as output section. So now we can see a transistor, uh, any one, to, if I am making base terminal common to both input as well as output, we call that as common base type of connection or common base configuration. If I make emitter common or ground the emitter, now the emitter terminal serves as common to both input side between base as well as common to 
or the output side between collector and emitter. So this mode of connection we call it as common emitter configuration. When you go to the common collector configuration, the collector is grounded. The input is applied between base and collector. The output is taken or drawn between emitter with respect to collector. Now the collector terminal is grounded. So to make the transistor to work as a two port device, to give the input on one side, to draw the output on the other side. So we make any one terminal common. So what do we achieve by doing this? So when you take common base configuration, in common base configuration, it has voltage gain but it does not have current gain. If you want to increase the voltage at the output, I can make common base configuration. But if I want both, I want to increase both current as well as voltage, then I go for common mode of connection where I can increase both current as well as voltage. If I want to use uh, in the common collector configuration which will fetch me high current gain but no voltage gain. I am not going to increase the voltage parameter but I am going to increase only current parameter. So in these different modes I can increase either voltage or current right whatever I require according to my uh, requirement. Now. So when I say transistor, we have uh, two sections, one we have already grounded either in any mode, common base, common collector or common emitter mode. Now we need to bias the transistor. So when we connect the transistor to the output uh, uh, power supply, we can achieve the biasing. So when the base emitter junction, the first junction that is between uh, base and emitter, if I am forward biasing this junction and reverse biasing this junction, collector junction, then I can have a operating region that is in the active region. So when you look at the transistor, I will just uh, uh, tell you in brief here. So this is my transistor. I have emitter, base and collector, three layers. This is emitter, this is base, this is collector. Suppose I am taking this as an N, P, N transistor. I can go with any mode. I am making base as common now to both input as well as output section. Now, as you know, when I say N, P, N transistor, if I say N, P, N transistor, here electrons are the majority charge carriers, electrons are majority charge carriers and holes are minority charge carriers along with donor, positive donor ions and here again electrons are majority charge carriers and holes are minority charge carriers, a few here and there and in base region we have holes as majority charge carriers and there are only few electrons as minority charge carriers. Now, what happens? This is a junction, as I told you. This is a junction. There is difference between N and P. Because of the concentration gradient, the electrons get diffused into the base region, right? And there is a depletion region. So this is a depletion region formed. There is a depletion region formed. And there is immobile ions there. Again, there is one more junction here. This is emitter junction, junction between emitter and base. This is the junction between collectors, so we call it as collector junction. So here, even here, we have a depletion region. We have a depletion region. Now, when there is a depletion region, the charge carriers cannot move from one side to another side. Therefore, we go for biasing. So since one of the terminal is grounded, so we need to apply voltage at this terminal and voltage at this terminal with respect to ground. So I have two ports here, one is the input port, other one is the output port. So I have four different combinations. So when I say two possible inputs, number of inputs is equal to two, I have two to the power of n combination. So n is two here, number of inputs is equal to two. So when I say two, then it is two to the power of two that is equal to four different combinations. So what are those? One is I can forward bias this, I can reverse bias that. Other one is I can forward bias this, I can forward bias this, I can reverse bias this, 
I can forward biases. I can reverse bias both the junctions. So when I do so, the depletion region can be altered. Right? So if I want the transistor to work in the active region, the mode of connection that should always or we should always choose is we should always forward bias the emitter and base junction and we should always reverse bias the collector junction. So when I do the forward biasing here, the depletion width will decrease, the width of the depletion region decreases. When the width of the depletion region decreases, the majority charge carriers move into the base. Now base is made thin and narrow as we have already discussed. There is no chance for recombination. The electrons are forced to go into the collector region and few electrons or few majority charge carriers, they recombine and they give rise to a current called as base current IB and the remaining electrons or remaining charge carriers, they move from base region to collector region. Now here, when I reverse bias this, the depletion region which is already existing between base and collector, it goes on increasing, widening and therefore there are no majority charge carriers and there are only minority charge carriers that are present because of the thermally, they are the thermally generated electrons here. So now that is called as the leakage current. Now when we reverse bias this and forward bias this, the charge carriers move from emitter section and reach the collector section and therefore we get a very important expression that is if I say if I forward bias, this is the N region, I have negative here, negative connected to negative and positive connected to positive, this is called as forward biasing and reverse bias, N must be connected to N must be connected to positive, the reverse of it and P must be connected to negative. So this is reverse bias. So when I do this, I get the electrons are moving this side, the electrons are moving this side, therefore I get a current called as emitter current IE. And few recombine here, they start to flow, I get base current I, IB. Then the electrons are moving onto this section, now I get the collector current I see. So we have three different currents in the transistor and therefore I can give this in form of an expression and we call it as transistor current equation. So the emitter is going to eject the electrons, give the emit, uh, emit the electrons, most of the charge carriers go and recombine in the base, gives rise to base current IB and few reach the collector, most of them reach the collector and this gives rise to collector current and this is called as the transistor current equation. Now we will move here, see when both the junctions are one base emitter junction is forward biased, collector junction is reverse biased, the transistor will be working in the active region and this is the region where the collector is ready to collect the electrons because the junction is reverse biased, the majority charge carriers have already moved into the collector and the transistor will operate in the active region and this will give rise, I mean we can use it for the amplification purpose. And when both the junctions are forward biased, base emitter junction is forward biased as well as collector junction is forward biased, there is excess of charge carriers moving from both the ends and therefore the transistor will go into saturation region. Now the transistor is loaded with charge carriers and therefore you can make the transistor to act as a closed switch or you can say that the transistor is fully on and there is lot of charge carriers, it is saturated of charge carriers therefore it goes into saturation. When both the junctions are reverse biased, what happens now? There are depletion region on the emitter junction, there is depletion region on collector junction as well and therefore there are no movement of charge carriers, it is cut off with the charge carriers, therefore the transistor is set to be under cut off mode and the region, in this region the transistor will act as an open switch when uh, it acts as an open switch and therefore the transistor will be fully off. So it can be acting as a switch under cut off as well as saturation and if both the junctions are, I mean when the emitter junction is forward bias and collector junction is reverse bias, this is the opposite of the first case and therefore you call it as inverted mode and we rarely make use of that mode in our applications or in our study here. Now 
you can see the graph this is cut off region saturation region and active region to make the transistor to work in the active region the collector junction must be always reverse biased and the emitter junction must be always forward biased you can see the image here this is a pn junction uh, we have studied the junction diode so this side you have p type material where holes are majority charge carriers electrons are minority charge carriers here electrons are more in number and holes are less in number now because of the concentration gradient the electrons and holes they start to diffuse the electrons move on to the other side as a result there's holes in the n region now this takes place because of the diffusion of electrons and holes this will take place because of the concentration gradient and therefore once this diffusion takes place not all electrons or not all holes will transfer across the depletion region few of them they just cross the junction and a depletion region is formed it is a barrier and it has only immobile ions there are no charge carriers now there is no charge transfer happening here the further transfer of charges they just stop now this is the image of a transistor we have three layers emitter base and collector emitter terminal base terminal and collector terminal now we have not applied any voltage across the terminals now there is a depletion region already formed between n and p between p and n when there is depletion region formed there is no movement of charge carriers now the transistor does not conduct any current therefore in order to make the charge carriers move from one region to another region we have to apply force from outside so what is this force we are applying a power supply we are going to take a dc power supply and we are going to connect it to the terminals of the transistor if i don't connect there is a depletion region and this transistor is set to be unbiased transistor biasing means you are going to apply voltage from outside external voltage to the terminals of the junction now for this transistor we have not applied any source from outside therefore we call it as an unbiased transistor there is there will be a question like what do you mean by an unbiased transistor so unbiased transistor is one where the transistor terminals are not connected to any external voltage source now when you apply external voltage source we are going to alter the depletion region you can play with the depletion region there so you can mod modify or you can moderate the depletion region by applying the external energy external source so when you apply external source across the terminals of the transistor you can say that the transistor is biased and this is a biased transistor there is a difference between unbiased transistor and biased transistor so this is the symbol of a biased transistor you apply any voltage whatever whether it is forward biased reverse biased whatever it is you are going to apply voltage from outside that is external voltage is applied across the terminals of the transistor we call that as a biased transistor we just saw the same diagram there we have done forward biasing here we have done reverse biasing here when we do the forward biasing the depletion region that between this emitter junction base and emitter goes on decreasing because this energy this is going to supply energy the electrons are repelled by the negative of the power supply and holes are repelled by the positive side of the power supply therefore the depletion region goes on decreasing as a result the majority charge carriers will go through the base section now base is made narrow and thin because if it is made larger there is a uh, chances of recombination taking place now there is no chance of recombination taking place hence all the charge carriers instead of recombining they move into the collector section right and now only few charge carriers they recombine and give rise to base current ib and remaining electrons they are collected in the collector section and they give rise to a current called as collector current ic the voltages between collector terminal and base terminal we write it as vcb and the voltage between emitter and base you call it as veb now how does the charges flow it is just like the charges move from the region of higher potential to region of lower potential so there must be some external force similarly water flows from 
higher potential to lower potential. You can see this, uh, we can just correlate this with the, the analogy of the water here. So, these are the water molecules moving from higher potential to lower potential. So, when it is moving from higher potential to lower potential, so there is a middle region what we call it as base which is going to control the flow. So, base is acting as a control, gate control. So, now this base will send the charge carriers from emitter section to base section only when the external voltage will be greater than the barrier voltage of the PN junction of the emitter base junction. So, the barrier voltage for base to emitter junction is around 0 0.7 volt because it is forward bias. So, we are going to have an voltage of 0 0.7 volt for silicon and 0 0.3 volts for germanium. So, if you exceed that voltage, if the external voltage becomes greater than the voltage of the barrier, then it can make the charge carriers move from uh, emitter to collector section. So, this is what exactly is. So, you can see here as the voltage increases 0.7, so voltage never rises above 0.7. So, it is going to increase after 0.7 it is going to stop and the current starts to move or the charge starts to move from emitter to collector. Now, let us see what is exactly bipolar junction transistor means and why do we call transistor as transistor? What exactly is BJT? Now, when we say BJT, B stands for bipolar. What is meant by bipolar? So, in a transistor, there are two kinds of charge carriers. One is electron, other one is hole. So, both carry charge and they start to move inside the transistor. Since there are two kinds of charge carriers in a transistor, the word bipolar is used. So, bipolar means there are two kinds of charge carriers. The current conduction is by holes as well as the electrons. The total current will be IE that is emitter uh, electron current plus hole current. So, both contribute to the flow of the current. Now, why transistor is called as transistor? So, this term transistor is literally taken from two different words. One is transfer other one is resistor it is coined by two words so one is transfer other one is resistor so what is this transfer means as we saw that base emitter junction junction one is forward bias depletion region is very very narrow now when it is forward bias the depletion is narrow and therefore the resistance is very very less the resistance of the emitter junction is very less and the resistance of the collector junction that is junction 2 because it is reverse bias depletion region becomes wide enough and therefore there is no movement of charge carriers and therefore the resistance is very high. So, when you forward bias the resistance is less at is junction 1 at junction 2 the resistance is very very high because it is reverse bias. Now, when I apply a signal when the current starts to flow from emitter to collector. Now, what happens is that current is flowing from low resistance region to a region of higher resistance. Therefore, it is transferring the signal or transferring the current from the region of low resistance to the region of higher resistance. Therefore, you are taking the word transfer plus resistor. We are, going to take, we are going to transfer the current from region of low resistance to the region of high resistance. Trans is taken from transfer and ester is taken from resistance. Now, transistor now belongs to the family of resistors also because it is going to transfer the resistance from one region to another region, current from one region to another region. Uh, we have a uh, term called as current gain. So, we have three different modes common base, common emitter as well as common collector. And when you connect base in the common base uh, configuration, this is the input section, this is the input current, this is the output section, therefore this is the output current. When I say gain, gain is always the ratio of output to input. When I take voltage gain, I take the ratio output voltage to input voltage. So, this will tell you how much amount of magnification or amplification is done. So, when I say current amplification, so we also call this as current amplification factor or current gain. So, current gain is the ratio of output current to input current. In common base configuration, emitter is the input current, 
collector current is the output current when I say IC divided by IE we get a gain the gain is indicated by alpha so alpha is the current gain in common base mode it is defined as the ratio of collector current IC to the emitter current IE in common emitter configuration emitter is grounded input current is IB output current is IC collector current when I say gain it is again output current divided by input current output current is IC input current is IB the gain in common emitter mode is called as beta or it is indicated by beta and it is defined as the ratio of collector current IC to base current IB in common collector mode again it is gamma it is IE divided by IB because collector is grounded so we are not going to talk about this so the relationship between alpha and beta is given by alpha is equal to beta divided by 1 plus beta and beta is equal to alpha divided by 1 minus alpha we take the transistor current equation divide of both the sides by IC and we can arrive at this expression Now, I said biasing, unbiased and biased transistor. Why should we go for biasing? What is the necessity for biasing and what should be the condition there? So, when you are applying a signal to a transistor, the transistor is going to amplify the signal. Then, before amplifying, it must satisfy two important conditions. What is that condition? One is, I said, the base current, the base emitter junction is having 0 0.7 volt or 0 0.3 volt for germanium so the external voltage must exceed that voltage only then the charge carriers can move therefore the first condition is the input voltage should exceed the cutting voltage or the threshold voltage or the barrier voltage of the diode that is pn junction forward bias pn junction of the transistor that is 0 0.7 and 0 0.3 for germanium the bjt should be always under active region so it should be in the active region to work as an amplifier that means base emitter junction should be always forward bias and collector junction must be always reverse bias so you should always keep it they'll ask you what is the condition for the transistor to work as an amplifier so always base emitter junction should be forward bias and collector base junction must be reverse bias now to go into that we need to know little bit of how to draw the characteristics to draw the characteristics we need to have an experimental setup so this is a common emitter configuration uh, emitter is grounded now i'm going to apply voltage between base with respect to emitter this is an npn transistor the arrow mark is pointing out you can see here npn transistor emitter is grounded so input will be up voltage will be applied between base with respect to emitter output is taken at collector with respect to emitter so we are going to apply voltage external voltage to the base emitter junction and the collector base junction now here base is positive therefore positive of the power supply is connected we call it as vbb voltage applied to the base terminal so there is a repetition of uh, two alphabets there in the subscript so when i say power supply it should be always double subscript of the same alphabet so this is vbb the supply voltage applied to the base terminal the supply voltage applied to the collector this is reverse biased and therefore the negative terminal is connected to positive terminal of the power supply and the other terminal will be connected to the ground negative is connected to ground so we name this as we label this as the supply voltage is indicated by capital alphabet v and double subscript when i say power supply it is double subscript and double subscript it is means it is connected to collector therefore we write it as vcc and the terminal voltages the voltage between base and emitter voltage is applied we are measuring the voltage at the base with respect to ground so emitter is grounded it comes in the second position voltage applied to base with respect to emitter we call it as vbe now voltage between collector terminal and emitter terminal so this is the output voltage which we are going to measure the voltage is applied or measured at the collector with respect to emitter therefore i write this as vce now what are we going to do now with this we can draw the input characteristics so what do you mean by characteristic graph so 
characteristic graph is one which we are going to relate between the input voltage and the input current. If I am relating between the input voltage VBE and the input current, we have as input characteristics. So, input characteristic is a graph relating input voltage and input current. Voltage on X axis, input voltage VBE on X axis and IB on Y axis. So now I keep on increasing the voltage. To arrive at this expression, we need to change the input voltage VBB. I keep on changing the input voltage or vary the input voltage. When I vary the input voltage VBB, VBE will change. It goes on increasing. As I told, it will increase only up to 0.7. It will never go beyond 0.7. So up to 0.7 I can alter this. So I keep on increasing this voltage. This is a variable supply. We have an arrow mark here. I keep on increasing the voltage and note down the voltage value here in the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and so on. You can see 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. The voltage goes on increasing. As this goes on increasing, I keep a track of the current here in this ammeter is a very very minute current in the order of microamps because base is very thin recombination happening is very very less and it gives rise to very small current IB. So IB we are going to measure here as I change this voltage the current does not increase because depletion region has to vanish. I have to apply larger amount external voltage must be greater than 0 0.7 until then there is no movement of charge carriers. After that crosses, that means depletion region goes on decreasing, then at 0.7 the charge carriers move. But practically it starts to move a little bit uh, earlier, 0.5, 0 0.6 volts and it starts to increase. So you can see the increase in current. But I have to keep one parameter constant at the output. What is that? So to get the input characteristics, vary the input voltage VBE, note down the input current IB by keeping the output voltage VCE constant. For constant value of VCE, what is this constant value? For example, I will set this voltage, I will increase this voltage and I read that VCE is 20 volts. It is showing me 20 volts in the ammeter, voltmeter. I get 20, I stop it. Then I come here, I start increasing my input voltage. Up to 0.7, I just see. It does not conduct. After 0.7, there is a shoot up of current. The depletion has vanished. The current is increasing. The charge carriers are moving from emitter to base region. So now the current has increased. So this is for one trial. I repeat the experiment. I change the voltage value. I decrease the bias here. I decrease the bias. As I decrease the bias, the depletion region goes on decreasing. So now for 10 volts. I set this to 10 volts, I repeat the experiment, vary the input voltage, note down the input current by keeping the output voltage constant. So I get a graph of this nature and this goes on increase, as the VCE goes on decreasing, the current goes on increasing. So this is called as early effect. Now we can get a graph and I can plot, take a slope at this region, the linear region of the curve which can give me the input uh, resistance of the diode, emitter base junction. Now, we will see the output characteristics. What is the output characteristics? We will say, we will take the same diagram. So, to get the output characteristics, now I change the output voltage VCC. When I change this voltage, this is going to change, VC is going to change. When this changes, the collector current will change. I have to keep some parameter constant here. In the input characteristics, I kept VCE constant. In the output characteristics, we will keep the input current, base current constant. So to draw the characteristic graph, we change VCE, VCE is varied in steps of 1 volt, 2 volt, 3 volt, etc. because it does not matter because depletion region is already existing there, I keep on increasing, the depletion region goes on increasing. As the depletion region goes on increasing, the charge carriers do not cross from collector to base, only thermally generated electrons are there, that is called as leakage current or reverse saturation current. So now, I increase this voltage, I note down the current in this by keeping the current constant here. Suppose I say IB is equal to 0, I have not applied any voltage here, I, my meter reading is showing me 0. Now I change the voltage. I get a set of points, I draw it on the graph. Again I change IB is equal to say 10 microamperes, I increase this, 
this is going to change here it is showing me a reading of 10 micro i stop it i come to this section i keep on increasing my output voltage as i increase my output voltage the output current also will start to increase and after some time it is going to stop so when you look at the graph here you can see as i increase the voltage the output voltage this is output voltage i'm going to increase the output current is going to increase you can see it is going to increase here then later on it is going to stop again for the next trial for ib some other value of ib say 10 micro amps i'm going to do the experiment for the 10 again the current goes on increasing this is for the second trial the current is increasing and later on it is going to remain constant for the third trial the output voltage is varied output current is noted for different value of ib constant i get a family of curves you can see there are a lot of curves here it increases remains constant so the input current is holding the output current is not making ic to increase so the transistor is called as a current control device the input current is controlling the output current it is not making the transistor output current to increase and you can call this as a current source it's going to give you a constant current so this is called as constant current characteristics so current is going to increase and remain constant for one uh, value of ib ib is equal to constant when i say ib is equal to 0 the first trial which we made the current is zero there as i increase the voltage and you can see a small current here so this is called as the leakage current we can call this as leakage current so the collector current produced because of the reverse bias because of the reverse bias when i make the input current zero but still there is some current because of the reverse bias and that is called as the leakage current i don't have any current there that is because of only the minority charge carriers so the region we can define the graph now we are going to divide the graph into three different regions so one is the region below ib equal to 0 and x axis is called as cut off the current is cut off there is no current at all the majority charge carriers are not moving from emitter junction to collector junction now and the region between the knee of the curve there is the bending of the curve and the y axis you call this as saturation region and in this region both the junction will be forward biased so when both the junctions are forward biased it is saturated of charge carriers and excess of charge carriers are there the transistor will be in the on state and this is a region where the transistor will work as an amplifier if i want to use it as an amplifier so in this region you can make the transistor emitter junction is forward bias and collector junction is reverse bias so i can make use this is a linear region where i can use this for my application of an amplifier so you can see here ic is equal to beta times ib plus beta plus 1 icbo so this is a leakage current leakage current and this equation is independent of uh, collector to emitter voltage if when ib is equal to 0 if i make ib is equal to 0 the collector current will be equal to beta plus 1 ic bo which is also equal to ic eo now what are the requirements to bias the transistor why we should bias i said biasing is done to moderate the depletion region so what are we going to achieve by doing this the operating point must be fixed we are going to coin a new word here we are going to come across a new word that is called as operating point which we will uh, see that in the later uh, concepts here so operating point or the q point must be fixed exactly at the center of the active region you, you can visualize what is active region now the operating point must be fixed exactly at the center of the active region now and it should not drift towards saturation or cut off so what happens we are going to see and we are going to stabilize the collector current the collector current must be stable it should not change because of any temperature variations collector current is very very sensitive to temperature as they do the reverse biasing as the temperature increases there is chances of minority charge carriers doubling for every 10 degree rise in temperature therefore it leads to a lot of uh, increase in the uh, reverse saturation current in total it is going to affect the total collector current so the collector current must be stable even if the temperature is going to vary and we are going to make the transistor q point independent of temperature q point must be made independent of temperature and this will avoid thermal runaway the next point is 
when you replace the transistor by another transistor suppose we are doing an experiment the transistor is replaced by another then the q point should not change uh, from the point where exactly it is being fixed so these are the requirements to bias the transistor they'll ask you what is the need for biasing what are the requirements of biasing one is transistor operating point must be fixed exactly in the active region center of the active region second point is stability of collector current against temperature variation third point is the q point must be independent of temperature variations to avoid thermal runaway and fourth point is that the q point should not change even when the transistor is replaced by another unit or another transistor now what happens if the q point if uh, i'm going to do the biasing so look at the diagram here so this is a circuit of an amplifier there is a biasing done here using a dc power supply as well as we have a ac signal here so this works as an amplifier now now transistor biasing after biasing we are going to give a signal to the transistor terminal now the transistor is taking a small input signal and magnifying the signal so that magnification of signal we call it as amplification so here when you say when you look at a microscope a uh, image under the microscope you get a magnified image similarly when you have a transistor if a small signal is given to the transistor the transistor is going to increase the strength of the signal weak signal and this process is known as amplification so when you superimpose the dc dc voltage and the ac signal now there is lot of variations that's going to happen so the signal when it is getting amplified you should have complete signal at the output without any distortion so this we call it as faithful amplification so you're going to draw a line to achieve that we're going to draw a line on the output characteristics so this is the output characteristics of the transistor collector to emitter voltage vce output voltage versus output current ic and uh, we're going to draw a straight line on the output characteristics when we say a straight line so we're going to join two points one is at the saturation region other one is at the cut off region so this when i say line there must be two points there so how to draw this okay to draw that again we are going to have come back to the circ experimental set uh, we have the biasing voltage vbb we have vcc here there is a resistor connected to the base we call it as base resistor rb a resistor is connected to the collector terminal therefore we can call this as collector resistor rc to measure the current i have a am, uh, ammeter here this is a microammeter which can measure the base current to measure the collector current i have collector uh, to measure the collector current i have a milliammeter ic to measure the voltage between this two terminals these two terminals and these two terminals i make use of an voltmeter this is measuring the voltage between base and emitter this is base with respect to emitter therefore base comes first emitter is grounded it comes to the second part and vce voltage at collector with respect to emitter now what is that we are going to achieve we are going to apply this voltage i'm talking about how we draw the dc load line so when i say transistor biasing why should be biased all four points along with that we see to that proper voltages what is the proper voltage vbe vce they are established proper voltage across the terminals of the transistor are established proper collect currents are flowing through the terminals of the transistor if everything goes fine proper ib flows proper ic flows proper ie flows then the transistor is under good condition there we can go for uh, the experiments or doing conducting any process there so now i have to establish proper voltages between the terminals across the terminals of the transistor and proper currents flow through the terminals of the transistor then we call that as dc biasing after dc biasing we are going to draw a straight line on the output characteristic graph like this and we are going to uh, mark the point on the uh, straight line there so how to draw now i have got my input circuit when i apply the voltage here i can apply kirchhoff's voltage law to the input circuit when we apply kirchhoff's voltage law to the input circuit uh, we say that kirchhoff's voltage law states that the applied voltage 
is equal to sum of all the voltages and the IR drops in a closed circuit. So whenever you are applying it, it is a closed circuit. So sum of all the voltages around the closed circuit is equal to zero or we can also say the sum of all the voltages is equal to sum of all IR drops in the circuit. So now when you apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, I go in this direction, I go from negative to positive, there is a voltage rise, therefore I say pos negative to positive, therefore it is positive. So VBB is equal to IB into RB, I into R is again voltage, IB RB plus voltage between base and emitter. VBE. So, I write the expression here. If I want this current IB, IB can be calculated by just uh, rearranging the expression IB is equal to VBB minus VBE divided by RB. So, I can know what uh, is my base current IB. Next, when you apply Kirchhoff's voltage law onto the output circuit, this is my output circuit. In the output circuit, I am going to traverse in this direction. So when I traverse in this direction, in the anti-clockwise direction, I go from negative to positive, therefore I get VCC will be equal to VCE, positive to negative, positive to negative. So VCE plus, plus to minus IC into RC. So this is my expression, I call this as equation number 1. And VCE will be equal to VCC minus IC into RC. Rearranging again, when you just make a small alteration, IC will be equal to VCC minus VCE divided by RC or I split this expression into VCC by RC and VCC by VCE by RC and I rearrange once again IC will be equal to minus 1 by RC into VCE plus VCC by RC. So when I look at this expression, this is the y axis, y is equal to mx, this is on the x axis plus c. So, this is the equation of straight line, first degree equation of straight line. Therefore, I can draw a straight line now by changing the values of uh, resistance and voltage here. So, now, so when you want to get a point here on the saturation region, on this saturation region, the voltage is 0, voltage is 0. On x axis, current is 0. So, when I make some parameter, voltage parameter 0 or current parameter 0 here, I get a value on x axis and y axis. So, you can see here, to get a point A on the characteristic graph, I make, I just take the expression, I take this expression. I make VCE is equal to 0. When I make VCE, when I say Y axis voltage is 0, therefore VCE is 0. VCC is a pass apply which I cannot make 0 here. So this is the voltage that I have applied to conduct the experiment. So when I make this parameter 0, I can know what is the current flowing here. So IC will be equal to 0 plus VCC by RC or I just take IC is equal to VCC by RC. So I mark a point here, IC is equal to VCC by RC on Y axis. Similarly, so this will give us a point on y axis. Now, when I make a point to get point B, to obtain point B, we are going to find the end points. They are going to ask you in the examination, draw the DC load line or find the end points of DC load line. So, we are going to follow this uh, expression here. VCE is equal to VCC minus ICRC according to the Kirchhoff's voltage law applied to the output circuit. Now, I make IC is equal to 0. When we make IC is equal to 0, literally we are seeing that the current is 0 here. When the current is 0 here, we are going to get a value of voltage on x axis that is VCE is equal to VCC. So, this is the point B on x axis. So, we got a point on x axis, we get a point on y axis, point A and point B. So, we draw a straight line with IC is equal to VCC by RC and VCE is equal to VCC. We draw a straight line joining these points on the output characteristics of the graph of the transistor. So, this line is called as the DC load line. Now we have seen what is a DC load line. So DC load line is a straight line drawn on the output characteristics of transistor which joins the maximum value of current that is VCC by RC and the cutoff region VCE is equal to VCC. 
Now, when we do this, we can get, we can achieve a line and we draw a line on the output characteristics of the transistor. Now, let us see what is meant by operating point or Q point. So, we also call operating point as Q point. So, now we know that the transistor will be functioning linearly and it will be constrained to operate in the active region. So, to make that work in the active region, we must always make base emitter junction to be forward biased and the collector base junction to be reverse biased. When we do so, we will establish proper DC voltage and proper DC current. So, now this will be achieved only when we are applying DC voltages but not AC voltage. So, this is we are, con uh, we are focusing only on the DC biasing. So, how do we define an operating point? So, the operating point is the zero signal values of collector to emitter voltage VCE and the zero signal current that is collector current IC. So, this value gives us the operating point. So, operating point is defined as the point at which a point of intersection of VCE as well as IC under no signal condition or zero signal condition. So, this will give you the value of collector current IC at Q and collector to emitter voltage VCE at Q point. So, because this operating point is fixed, this point is also called as quizzent point. So, it is abbreviated as Q, quizzent is abbreviated as Q. So, by definition, Quizzent means silent or you can call it still or it is at rest or it is inactive. So, that is the reason we call the operating point as Q point. That means we have not applied any AC input signal to the transistor, but we have applied only the DC biasing voltage. So, when we apply DC biasing voltage, the values we get when we fix the operating point exactly at the center of DC load line that point is called as Q point. So, the values of the signal, AC signal value will be resting at the DC values when you apply the AC signal. That is at Q, the coordinate of the Q point is VCE comma IC. Now, when we draw a line on the output characteristic of the transistor, which will be joining saturation point and cutoff point, we are going to fix a point at the center of the DC load line. So, this point is called as Q point. Now, why should we do this? In order to get faithful amplification, we are going to fix the operating point exactly at the center of DC load line. What do we mean by faithful amplification? So, faithful amplification means when we apply a signal at the input of the transistor, we get an amplified image at the output. When you get an amplified image at the output, there must not be any distort, distortion at the output. That means there is a possibility of the signal clipping at the top or at the bottom of the signal. So, if you can reproduce the signal as it is, Whatever the signal that I have given at the input of the amplifier will get amplified and comes out without distortion and such a phenomenon is called as faithful amplification. So, amplification is a process of strengthening the weak input signal without changing its frequency. We are going to change only the magnitude of the signal that is the amplitude of the signal. So, we can increase the amplitude of the signal or strength of the signal without changing the frequency of the signal. Such a phenomenon is known as amplification. Faithful amplification is one which we get the same replica of the input signal but in a amplified way or a magnified way. Now, let us look at this graph. So, we have applied an input waveform at the input of the transistor. So, we are not going into the transistor amplifier. This is just for the purpose of analysis that we are going to see here. This is the input signal that we have chosen. Now, when this goes into the amplifier, so this is the resting value of uh, the DC. This is the Q point or operating point. When the signal is passed into the transistor, the transistor will amplify and you can see the output swing. There is the output voltage in a magnified way. 
So, you should get the complete signal whatever that we have given in the output, in input without any loss. Now, what happens if the operating point has been shifting towards saturation or towards cutoff? The operating point has a tendency to move up and down and it can swing on any point, it gives you all the points, you can just have the operating point in any of the points on the DC load line. If the operating point is being shifted here, how to shift it? It can be shifted by choosing the values of RC, the collector resistor. If you change the value of collector resistor, there is a tendency of moving uh, uh, movement of the operating point. So, that is what we call it as the design of transistor. So, choosing the correct values or the right values for designing the circuit will fetch us a good circuit. So, if in case my operating point is shifted towards the saturation region. So, let us see we have applied the input signal here. Let us observe the output signal. So, the output is amplified. Now, the amplified signal that is being shifted towards this we are going, this, we are going to take this as center and if there is an output swing to left as well as right and you can see there is a clipping of the signal. This signal will be lost, the information will be lost. So, there is a chance of clipping of one of the sides of the signal. So, this is if the, satur if the Q point moves towards saturation. Now, if Q point moves towards cutoff, if the Q point moves towards cutoff, you can see this is the center point and the output is going to swing across the center here. So, we have applied the input, the operating point is considered to be near the cutoff region. So, now the signal has moved here, there is a chance of signal being clipped off in this side. So, in order to have a complete signal, we should see to that the operating point will be exactly at the center of DC load line as we saw in case, case 1 here. There is no clipping, it is exactly at the center, there is an output swing. If it is moving towards saturation, this part will be clipped off. If you move towards cutoff, this part of the signal will be cut off depending upon how much it is going to move. Therefore, the operating point should be always fixed at the center of DC load line. So, if you want to make the transistor to work as an amplifier, then Q point must be always fixed at the center of DC load line. What about if you want to use it as a switch? You want to make this transistor to work in the on state or in the off state. So, if you want to make the transistor to be working in the on state that is both the junctions would be forward by us then the Q point must be selected such a way that it will go towards saturation region. If the Q point is going towards the cutoff region then you can have the Q point near to the cutoff region. So, then the transistor will be in the off state, there is no current and therefore, you can use the transistor as a switch. For the purpose of switch, Q point can be near saturation or Q point can be near cutoff to be in the off state and saturation to be in the on state. To make it as an amplifier, Q point should be exactly at the center of DC load line. Now, let us have a recap here. The key factors for the faithful amplifications, these are very very important. So, to ensure that we need to have a faithful amplification, the following conditions are necessary to be observed. So, there must be proper zero signal collector current, IC. IC must be proper. That means, you should bias the transistor without applying any input signal. Transistor must be biased. You should see to that proper IC or collector current flows when there is no signal. That is what it means zero signal condition. Next is minimum base to emitter voltage must be there at any instant of time. I, I, I told you VBE is 0 0.7 volt for silicon, 0 0.3 volts for germanium. If the external voltage base or bias voltage exceeds VBE, then only there is a possibility of the charge carriers to move from emitter region to base. Therefore, we should always maintain VBE at a constant value and proper emitter voltage must be there, collector to emitter voltage must be there. So, if you, if all these conditions are fulfilled, then you, if all these conditions are satisfied, then you can have a faithful amplification. So, these are the conditions that you should always see to that, that you can have faithful amplification. Now, let us see a numerical based on this. 
let us consider this circuit. So, this is the circuit that you have been given uh, the bias circuit where the base resistor R B is given as 10 kilo ohm, collector resistor is 1 kilo ohm, the supply voltage V C C is 10 volts and you are supposed to draw the D C load line and the operating point Q point. Okay? So, now, now let us say uh, the base current is fixed at 25 micro ampere and what should be the collector current, corresponding collector current. So, when you draw the characteristics for constant I B, when you draw the output characteristics for one constant I B you get a collector current. So, for say 25, if this is fixed at 25 micro amps, what would be my collector current? So, collector current can be calculated as I C is equal to beta times I B. So, this is in the common emitter configuration, the current gain of common emitter configuration is beta. So, beta is equal to I C divided by I B, output collector current divided by input base current and therefore, I can calculate the value of I C by using the formula I C is equal to beta times I B. I will substitute the value of beta and I B. So, beta value is given as 200 and this is the base current I B 25 micro amperes 25 into 10 raised to minus 6 and you get around 5 milliampere. Similarly, when you apply K V L to the output circuit, we have already done this V C E is equal to V C C minus I C into R C. So, we want the output voltage V C E. So, the applied V C C is 10 volts. So, we can substitute the value of V C C as 10 minus IC value is 5 milliamps and RC value is 1 kilo ohm. So, now when I multiply this, I get 10 minus 5 is equal to 5 volts. Now, I shall consider this point 5 milli volts and 5 volts are the coordinate points for this value of base current IB. Now, let us move on to the next one. Suppose if I change my value of IB to 40 microamps. So, I will replace I B with 40 microamps and I will find the value of collector current, what would be my collector current and what would be my collector to emitter voltage V C E. We take the same formula I C is equal to beta times I B and V C E is equal to V C C minus I C into R C, beta is 200, I B we have substituted as 40 because we have changed it to 40 microamps, I get 8 milliamps. Similarly, V C E I am going to get 10 volts minus this I C into R C the product will give me 8, I get 2 volts. Now, I get a point for the Q point values as 8 milliamps and 2 volts, 2 volts comma 8 milli milliamps. We will go with an, an another example, if I say I am going to change my IB to decrease my IB value to 10 microamps, I am changing 10, 40, 25 to different values of IB. Now, for this I get IC is equal to 2 milliamps and VCE is equal to 8 volts. Now, let us plot this on a graph. See here, when I say IC, IB is equal to uh, 10 microamps, this is the least value that I have taken, I get 8 volts and 2 volts, 8 volts and 2, 2 milliamps. So, this is one Q point that I have marked. Suppose if I change my IB, if I change my IB, the Q point is going to shift somewhere here. So, the corresponding values of collector to emitter voltage and collector current when no signal is applied is called as Q point. So, these are the coordinate points of Q point V C E comma I C. So, that is what we have written V C E is 5 volts, I C is 5 milliamps. Suppose if I have increased my base current I B, we have run it for 40 microamps. For that, we have got the collector to emitter voltage as 2 volts and I C as 8 milliamps. I mark this on the DC load line, on the same DC load line for different values of I B uh, values, current values. So, I get 2 volts and correspondingly 8 milliamps. Now, just look at this. If I change the base current value, there is a tendency of Q point shifting on the DC load line. Okay? So, this Q point is near to saturation. If I fix this, I am going to lose one part of the signal. If I choose this point, I am going to lose one part of the signal. If I choose this point, I can have the complete swing of the output current or output voltage across the output. So, this is how we are going to cho choose operating point. So, operating point, you can define operating point as a point 
on the DC load line exactly fixed at the center of the DC load line under zero signal condition that is when no signal is applied it gives us the values of VCE and IC collector, co collector to emitter voltage VCE and collector current IC. So this will give you the values of the Q point or the quizzent point.